Radio on the 13th of February 2014, and our guest tonight is uh, David Lim, uh, doctoral researcher X X of uh, Reading University. I better not say they're still getting in trouble. Um, we spent uh, a day down in Somerset at the the floods. Uh, it took uh, well, it took us about six and a half hours to get from Portersboro down to there. It normally should take about four, but um, there you go. And we met David there and. Basically, we went down with some documentation uh, regarding the the policy documents which the Environment Agency had, had been stupid enough to publish uh, over the years, and in particular the one in 2008, which uh, stated quite um, openly that they were going to deliberately um, flood uh, Somerset levels. I'll just get the, the quote up here in a second. Um, they, this was part of the policy, I think policy unit eight, I think they called it, Somerset Levels and the Moors, and, and this is what it says. Uh, policy option six, take action to increase the frequency of flooding to deliver benefits locally. Now, I don't know what benefits they're going to deliver locally when they flood you. Um, I don't know, maybe they're going to introduce some rare fish or, or something. But um, uh, benefits locally or elsewhere which may constitute an overall flood risk reduction. I mean, if that makes sense to anybody, you know, good luck to you. Um, note, this policy option involves a strategic increase in flooding in allocated areas, but it is not intended to affect the risk to individual properties. We'll try telling that to the people who've been washed out of their homes, uh, Mr., uh, Mr. or Lord Smith, whatever you want to call yourself. Um, David. Good evening. Good evening. How are you? I mean, that. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. You got home okay? I did indeed. Yeah. 
Good, good. Yeah, I mean, that statement alone uh, should be enough for most people to uh, understand that um, what we're seeing here is it's uh, no accident. Uh, abs- uh, well, personally, I think absolutely not. When you start to put the pieces of the, the jigsaw together that everybody was talking about, you, sh- you soon come to the realisation that a lot of things with this particular uh, event don't stack up in a way, but when you start to look at the policy documents and then the science and the historical precedents, um, it does start to add up, actually. And alarmingly, what we're finding is uh, what you've just quoted, to be honest, is um, a flurry of policy stemming from 1992 on the Convention on Biological Diversity from the United Nations, which stemmed from the Earth Summit in Rio. Um, what, what came out of that was um, a raft of policies that EU then picked up through Natura 2000 and uh, subsequently the UK government in 2005 created a document making, making space for water I think we, we looked at and we started to show the locals. But um, it's, it, it's an interesting situation, Neil. Um, the, the area that we were located at, we, 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 we spent time in Borough Bridge, which is um, just outside Langport. Um, it's the, the river parrot, parrot catchment, which is about, um, it, has, it has a catchment area of about 1,700 square kilometres, actually. And there's a, a captive population of about 300,000 Um, when you start to draw together um, Taunton, Bridgewater and Yeovil. So we took down documents, as you say, we we printed them off. And would you like to maybe start describing what what, what events started to unfold when we presented some of these documents to, to to the locals down there? Yep, sure. Um, well, the, the document we actually printed off was an article by uh, Dr. Uh, Richard North uh, on the EU referendum website, which had that quote in it and um, a short article about the how the European Union had um, basically uh, forced this upon the British Well, I say forced it upon the British government, but I'm sure they were quite happy to take it. Um, and of course, uh, that comes from, as David said, the, the Rio summit in 1992. Uh, whereby Agenda 21 was introduced and all this stuff you can trace directly back to that, you know, and um, putting the land back to nature and et cetera, et cetera. Um, the, so we, we printed off the article, I think it was only covered two pages or so, and we we had a meeting in the, the local pub there, the King Alfred, uh, where the cameras set up and we, we filmed it as if it was, you know, it's, well, it is going to be part of a, a documentary on the whole flooding thing. Uh, and geoengineering, which we'll come on to later. But uh, we, had, we had no issue with that. The, the landlords seemed to, to be okay about it. The, the locals were okay. But uh, at one point, we spoke to the landlord. Who, we didn't know he was a landlord at the time, but uh, he was um, helping out with the, the flood uh, rescue mission, as it were. And uh, we showed him this document and, and also a map that was in the same um, policy document from the Environmental Agency. The Environment Agency. Um, a map which uh, clearly shows uh, the area to be flooded, um, which was the Somerset Levels. And it actually says on that map, uh, the area, uh, policy number six, take action to increase flood risks strategically to the benefit of other areas. And when you look at the map, the other areas, the only other areas that are going to benefit are actually Bridgewater, Taunton and Yeovil. Um, anybody else staying in that that whole area is simply going to be washed out um and i, I mean there, there are towns and villages all over the the place there which um the, the policy for those areas is to continue with existing actions in other words doing nothing and accept the increase in flood risks over time so basically they're going to they're going to flood the center of the area and just let the flood water um pour into other areas and um protect the three small towns. But anyway, we, we showed this map to the landlord of the pub and basically, I, I don't know I don't know how you describe the reaction, but uh, he, start, he started off by listening to what we said and then he, he all of a sudden just, um, I, I, I don't say snapped and said, I don't believe a word of it and just stormed off. So um, maybe he did actually believe it deep down and uh, just couldn't accept it. But um uh, that, I mean, that was the only negative reaction we really got. But um, 
apart from when we stood outside and uh, a chap, I can't remember his name, uh, came over demanding that we show him our NUJ press passes. Now, of course, we don't have NUJ press passes. We have uh, NAPJ uh, press passes, uh, which is the National Association of Public Journalists, which um, we set up at the Community Press Group, which is a, a limited company, and um, they have... Uh, they, they can't do a thing about it, they are official press cards. Um, so he seemed quite happy with that, and uh, I asked him who he was, and he was apparently the uh, chairman of the local flood committee which had been set up in, in light of what had happened. And he was basically telling us that uh, some people had come to him and didn't like the message we were putting out. And a couple of the ladies that were there said, what, what message? We're, we're only um, showing them government documents, official government documents, and, and showing them that this had been done deliberately. But... Um, he wasn't having it and he was quite uh, frosty, I'll say, for a while. And then he went off and about 10 minutes later, one of the, the ladies there who uh, I don't think anybody could argue with if, if they wanted to, um, went over and spoke to him on, on her own. And he kind of mellowed a bit and agreed that um, once the the floodwaters had receded that we could possibly come back down and, and put on a talk or a public meeting or whatever and um, we can explain the the documents we had then but um yeah i mean that that was about the gist of it but i mean we we did speak to a, a sikh gentleman who was there as part of a basically a charity a small charity uh, and they'd been involved in going to haiti and they're still actually in haiti um which he told us was uh, quite unusual because all the big charities had uh, taken their money and gone and uh, left the little boys to do it but so we had um a Sikh gentleman, um, I think he was, I think he originated from Bangladesh or, or somewhere around there, which is quite ironic considering uh, that's one of the, the largest floodplains in the world and uh, the most uh, populated. But he was over here um, helping out with the flood victims in Somerset, along with the, the British Red Cross who were there and quite a lot of firemen. And not not very many police officers, um, but certainly no, no army, which was supposedly promised um, by David Cameron. Uh, and whoever else decided to go down there for a photo shoot in their um, nice Burberry Wellingtons. But, um, yeah, that, I mean, that was about it, David. I, I mean, I don't know if you had any other experiences of anybody else, but um, that, that was the only um, negative uh, I came across. I think that's quite a, su a succinct David? summary. Yeah, I think that's quite a succinct summary. Uh, what I would add is that there, there were a number of film crew down there, uh, Sky News were down there in particular whilst we were filming. Uh, one of our group approached the uh, the journalists and w were handing out information to them. Uh, they, they appeared fairly interested at first, and then when I approached them, they appeared maybe not to take too much of an interest. Um, I know that there was a couple of other film crews down there at, at, the, at that particular time. But as, as you say, it, it appeared that everyone just wanted to get down there for the story for the for the horrific shots of the water lapping up to the to the road the sandbags the the vehicles there was a um, a, a vehicle there pulling out a recovery vehicle so it's a, uh, a, a quite an ironic situation but um, i think you know it's been going on for so long just to put people in the picture the flooding has been on and off more or less since christmas 2013 Historically, the flood plain is, is is just that, really. I was looking through the, the catchment, uh, the Parrot Catchment Flood Management Plan. That's the, the 2012 Environment Agency Managing Flood Risk Report. And they explain in detail that uh, since Roman times, attempts have been made to evacuate the flood water on the, on the low-lying areas. But... Um, Interestingly, when you look at the uh, flood management risk catchment plan of 2012, so there was uh, one in 2005, one in 2008, one in 2009, and 2012 is the most recent one, I believe. So looking at the, again, it's quite ironic when you when you start looking at these documents in, in any great detail. So the, I think the first cover almost reads uh, word for word. It says that um, with Environment Agency, it is our job to look after your environment and make it a better place for you and for, for future generations. Your environment is the air you breathe, the water you drink and the ground you walk on. 
and then it goes to talk about uh, how they're making it a better environment and a better place. So from from the outset, I think it's quite ironic that the Environment Agency has failed on numerous accounts of their initial um, objective statement, to be honest. The other interesting point I picked up for, for that particular report is that they talk about the flood risk management plan being for the next uh, 50 to 100 years. Uh, and I thought to myself, hang on a minute, 100 years. And in further um, further investigation, they talk about the, the difficulty and challenges about assessing the current impact of flooding to the environmental features. Now, again, when, once you put on your critical thinking hat, uh, you, you think to yourself, hang on a minute, if, they, if they're finding it difficult to model and assess the current impact, why are they putting policy in place for the next 100 years? Which, again, was quite, was quite challenging to get your head around at some point. But uh, the plane has flooded. I think w one of the large floods occurred in 1947. And again, in winter 2000, in fact. But I think the point is that the government has had a, a directive, flood, a flooding directive from the EU in 2007. And off, off the back of that, they've put together policy, as you've correctly stated, that they're wanting to purposely test or flood certain planes in order to uh, manage the, the water volumes across the whole catchment area. Well, if they wanted to do that, which they indeed have stated, then surely that they need to put the correct communication strategy in place when addressing the public. And I think you would agree, Neil, when we were there, people were scurrying around. A lot of people had been evacuated, moved. Um, I think the, the insurance toll at the time was about 630 million. Um, subsequently, I, I know other other places of the UK have experienced similar conditions. I think we've had Oxford, we've had Gloucestershire, um, parts of Surrey, Chertsey, Windsor, Staines. And I, I heard um, a report this morning saying that the, the toll is clocking around, uh, you know, a billion pounds or, or thereabouts. So, you know, the, there are uh, impacts on all all levels. I know the farmers down there are having horrendous problems. We've had stories with them needing to move cattle. I think the, the community itself has, has pulled together fantastically. It really has. The people have helped themselves and been in contact with, with other people. And, and it's a great feeling to, to see the, the cooperation that can emerge from these emergency situations. Would, would you say that's a, a kind of fair fair point, Neil? Yeah, absolutely. And I think we kind of learned a bit of a lesson um, in that we were down there. And unfortunately, um, you know, there have been the uh, sensationalist media news crews down there just want to snap their pictures and uh, not really giving a toss about the locals, to be honest. Um, I mean, the, the I think it was the Sky News, they were on the, the roof of the pub or the, the porch at the back of the pub. And uh, I just thought, well, you know, um, you know, they won't even get their feet wet. They were standing on the roof. Um, and I think, you know, the, the, the guy who um, got a bit frosty did did explain that that day they were dealing with somebody who had a heart attack and uh, somebody else who they'd had to rescue from um, a flooded home or something. And yeah, you, I mean, you, you've got a feel for them. And But at the same time, a sense, as, as you say, they're coming together now. But um, I think um, after this, I mean, there's going to be looking for some serious answers, um, not just from uh, not just from David Cameron and those morons, but uh, even even their own local councillors and, and people like that. Although we, we did speak to the local councillor, I can't remember his name, and he was um, quite open to the the information. He took it away, and he um, I, th I think I sensed that he was um, he was quite. Uh, I could have put it um, irate uh, underneath the surface where he was uh, staying quite calm. But um, I think uh, we've got a, a kind of inroad there to him uh, and possibly, you know, getting some kind of meeting going with local people. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I was actually surprised there, there weren't that many people around. There, there were only people who were, the only people we saw were really people who were um, basically helping out. Uh, I didn't see any, I, didn't, I certainly didn't see any children around the place. 
uh, or any any pensioners or such. I think they'd all kind of gone off uh, somewhere else. But um, yeah, I mean, we only saw a, a small section of it. I mean, we, we drove in from all different directions and saw, you know, quite horrendous flooding in the, the surrounding countryside. And the I I passed the the Dutch uh, pumps that came in. I didn't actually get a, a picture of the the pumps themselves. I, I got the picture of the water being pumped out back into the into the river. But um, you know, I, he, here we are. Um, the environment agencies um, sold uh, a load of pumps for scrap, and we're bringing people over from Holland to do the job. It just seems uh, quite ironic. Uh, and we're not talking about uh, the sea coming in here. We're talking about rainwater. In effect, uh, you know, and we, we've got the Dutch guys who have kept the sea out of Holland for uh, decades, but um, we can't seem to to keep rainwater off the land. It's, it's quite incredible, really. Um, we'll we'll go to a piece of music and then we'll we'll come back and uh, maybe go through some of the, the the reasons as to why this has happened. Um, I think the first piece of music is um, welcome back to Reality Rights Radio uh, with our guest David Lim. And um, there was one quote that somebody sent me today from a document called uh, Communities and Local Government National Pan- Planning Policy Framework, and that's from March 2012. And it says in this, um, where climate change is expected to increase flood risk so that some existing development may not be sustained in the long term, seeking opportunities to facilitate the relocation of development, including housing, to more sustainable locations. Now, that's part of a bigger quote, but... Um, Basically, what they're saying there is um, they, were, they were seeking an opportunity uh, to basically get people off the land to, to more sustainable locations like towns and cities. Uh, and so this is Agenda 21, um, bold and brilliant, if you like. And it's uh, it's very noticeable in, in all these documents that the, the focus is on the effects of climate change, something that they, they cannot possibly um, back up with any um, pertinent science at all. Uh, and in fact, all the science has shown that um, the whole bogus um, man-made global warming um, due to CO2 is is absolute nonsense. Uh, and yet, they're focusing all their energy, is throwing millions, uh, billions of pounds at it. Um, and, and in the meantime, they're, they're just ignoring uh, common sense the flood precautions like just um, having a the flood barriers, dams, um, sluices, dredging, etc., um, which we're, we're going to talk about shortly. So, David, you were talking about um, some of the other documentation that you've come across and some of the other um, relevant material in them. Within that report, the, the 2012 report, Managing Flood Risk for the, the, the Parrot Catchment Area, um, there's a, a portion in that document that talks about how the government currently manage the risk and they they talk about providing flood forecasting and warning services and the need to promote awareness of flooding so that organizations communities and individuals are aware of the risk and are prepared in case they need to take action now i'm sure if we canvassed a lot of people in that catchment area and asked them were you aware how sooner would you have liked the information what kind of time windows would you need to prepare? Then I, I'm pretty sure that um, the locals may have disagreed with uh, some of the policy implementation and the lack of coordination that has been uh, been been done. But uh, also in, in policy six, um, it mentions about needing to take action to to store water as well. So water storage for for for, for people obviously. Um, who who know a little bit about hydrology is about maintaining water bodies on on the floodplains, in association to to managing runoff as well. So that was the uh, the other thing I'd like to to put in there. But it's, uh, yeah. it's well, just, just 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 on that, David. Sorry. Yeah. Just on that. I mean, I, I don't think people are aware of the quantity of water we're talking about here. I mean, this goes in. Uh, was it millions of tons? Well, just of, of water. Just, yeah, roughly the statistics break down. It's a 25 square mile area or thereabouts, and we're looking at 66 million cubic meters of water. So that's 66 million tons. So each cubic meter is a ton. 66 million tons of water just there. Now, 
I have had conversations with people in the fire service, and this was last week. And they, the pumps currently back uh, a week ago were moving about three and a half tons a second. So based on those calculations, it would take about two months for the water to be sufficiently drained. Now, as you say, the, the Dutch engineers have got in there and installed some of their equipment. So I'm still waiting to hear for figures precisely about the, the duration in which the, the draining will occur. So that'll, that'll be interesting when, when that comes out as well. But um, the, the, re the report in particular also talks about the proposed actions to implement the preferred policies for certain areas. And as you were saying, that there's six policy options and uh, policy six being where water yeah, would essentially be needing to, to, to sustain certain bodies to reduce flood risks elsewhere. But um, it talks about undertaking uh, comprehensive studies of the geomorph geomorphography of the, the River Parrot and the Tone. And it'd be quite interesting to see, uh, as of yet, what, what that study uh, will, will, will yield. It'll be quite uh, fascinating to, to have a look at the report when that comes out. Well, I mean, I'm looking at this map again, and uh, we've got the three towns, as I mentioned, uh, Bridgewater, Taunton and Yeovil. Uh, now, Bridgewater and Yeovil are shaded in with the same colour, uh, and that comes under policy four, which is take action to ensure no increase in flood risk over time. But, I mean, no increase doesn't mean it's not going to flood. Um, you know, they're, they're still possibly going to get flooded. Um, and the other area, Taunton, is in policy area five. Uh, so it says, um, take action to reduce flood risk at a date to be determined. So, I mean, they're not going to take any action whatsoever because they haven't they haven't set a timetable for it. They haven't t made any plans whatsoever. So I suppose, uh, you know, out of the, the three um, habitats that people are going to be forced to, um, they're probably better picking one of the other two rather than go to Taunton because that seems to be the next on the list to go. But um, it's there doesn't seem to be any... Um, constructive policy if you, if you go through one to, one to six uh, to stop anywhere flooding. I mean, the, the policy one is no active intervention. So that means do nothing. So um, if somewhere's, somewhere's going to flood, it's going to flood and that's it. You know, you better get out. Uh, policy number two, reduce existing flood risk management actions. Uh, reduce existing flood risk management actions. Now that sounds like I, mean, I don't know if that's an oxymoron or what, but it, it, that sounds like they're, they're going to take away um, um, machinery or, or whatever to to which helps in flooding, and just let it happen anyway. Um, policy three: continue with existing actions, accepting increase in flood risks over time. In other words, do nothing and just uh, let it flood, and it gets worse as you go through them. You know, well, policy number four is the only one um, that basically. Um, advocates the status quo, and that that's as good as it gets. I mean, ev everything else is, is going to be detrimental to people. That's that's the way I read that. There, there is not one positive policy there to stop anywhere flooding. No, I think I, I would support your your views on that, Neil. To be honest, um, I think another interesting part of this puzzle is the the dredging aspect. Of it. So, for nearly two decades, the the river tone and the parent parrot haven't been dredged sufficiently. Um, I know that there was about four hundred thousand pounds put aside, with a view to needing uh, about um, a billion. Um, sorry, uh, I think ten million was required to, to conduct a, a, a full scale dredging. And uh, at the time that they were waiting for other agencies to be forthcoming with those funds, which obviously weren't. And locals uh, have been saying, well, if you had 400,000 in the pot, why weren't we using those funds even, you know, as a small proportion of what was required? But, you know, why, why was nothing Im implemented? And obviously, when you start to look into this, um, the, the policy dictates that they that they, they can't or, or it would have been deemed, um, you know, a, a negative effect had they started dredging at all. So, again, once... You put the uh, the information together. Even even if the the ten million was there, then you'd have to s seek sp special permission from Brussels to actually implement a dredging policy. So that's uh, again an another example of where 
EU policy supersedes that um, of of national policy. Um, again, it's it's quite a, quite an alarming alarming uh, cir- set of circumstances. I think you yeah. know, many people have have been um, asleep for far too long. Um, you know, if you think about a lot of these policies stemming from you know the the Rio, the Earth Summit in 1992. Uh, I think you know we could be here for a whole evening just talking about Agenda 21 um, and the the need to control um, the inventory and control all of the resources of the planet, essentially, from energy to to people. Um, and the famous quotes within the Agenda 21 policy document is that of population management and reduction. So, but uh, well, c- certainly, certainly, um, you know, uh, for. You know, centuries, uh, thousands of years, people have been driven off the land, and uh, you know we, we can't quite do it with guns and bullets anymore. But um, this is um, this is possibly far more effective because people just won't, don't want to live there. I mean, it, I don't I don't see what option people are going to have if uh, these kind of policies are just left to run, and every year you get flooded. I mean, you're not going to put up with it. You're just going to leave, and uh, that's exactly what they want. They want you off the land and um, return it to um, a bird sanctuary. Um, it's just uh, I don't I don't know what it takes to get people to 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 understand what's going on. I think it's, um, it's it has to be becoming more and more obvious to people when they when they see that. Um, I mean, to to call the politicians incompetent is um, is such a, a a misrepresentation of um, even their ability to be incompetent because. Uh, They've no ability whatsoever. I mean, if they can't uh, do the basics, then they're not fit for the job. I mean, uh, Chris, I think the Chris Smith or Lord Smith, whatever he wants to call himself. I mean, even his uh, his quote, his um, his talk on it was on t- on the Today program on Monday, where this this issue was brought up about this being a deliberate policy, and uh, we we discussed this uh, yesterday and today that. Um, I think this was a, a deliberate um, ploy to get it out there and get it swept under the carpet as quickly as possible so that nobody actually jumped on it in the mainstream media at all, as if, as if they, they would anyway. But um, this is what um, Lord Smith said. Uh, no, that certainly hasn't been. This is when he was, he was challenged on this policy six. No, that certainly hasn't been. Certainly since I've been chairman of the Environment Agency, which was after that document, which I have to confess I've never seen and never taken any notice of. Now, if he's never taken any notice of, of the documentation, um, which is to do with his job, then he's not fit for his job, clearly. And then he goes on to say, that is certainly not environment agency policy as of now. This was on Monday. Um, it hasn't been for the last five and a half years while I've been chairman. Well, he's just contradicted himself because he, he's basically said that the policy is going to stop as of Monday. And yet it hasn't been policy for the last five and a half years. So... Um, you, you mentioned the, the latest report, um, 2012, which is basically the same, except I, I don't think this map's in it, but it's the same policy. Policy 6 is still in there. Um, so it clearly is uh, the policy of the current en- Environment Agency and this um, moron. Over yeah. to you, David. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, <laughs> what more can be said, to be honest? I think it's just, you know, time and time after... We get these stories coming out where it's just huge, you know, negligence on on many levels, many many levels. But I'm, I would say this, Neil, that reading reading this document, there's a, a paragraph in there saying that you know one of the purposes the report was written is to inform local government and their um, and their responsibilities to, to to warn people, to warn the locals, etc. So, and it's just failure throughout the whole system to be honest from from national to to, to local government now the policy document has been there um, we've it's openly stated that certain areas were, were needing to be flooded uh, or or not looked at for those reasons um, so you know they, they've had years absolutely you know, years to, to look at this and put some kind of uh, policy in place you know some, some, some long, long-term policy in place to to look at this and if it was a case of you know communicating to the people that this may happen, that the risks are significant, and to put a a relocation plan in place over maybe a decade or, or so, um, I think that's to be honest, in my opinion, the very least that that should have happened. You know. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, I mean, the, the Dutch, as I say, the, the Dutch have kept the sea out of Holland, uh, which is on below sea level, for, well, I don't know what it is now, a couple of hundred years. Uh, and uh, we can't keep a river out. Uh, and I did, I did say to you and, uh, and Dave that uh, it makes you wonder why they didn't build the um, the barrage, the Bristol barrage, which would have acted as some kind of barrier uh, and produced electricity, of course. But um, maybe maybe that's part of the reason they didn't build it because they wanted to let the floodwaters in. But um, that's just my opinion, of course. But um, it's uh, yeah, I mean, I, I I don't think it is incompetence. I, I think it's um, they they know exactly what they're doing, um, and they're just the the front men really, and they get their orders and they just um, you know the, in their their um, at the eyes of the masters, they're they're doing a fantastic job. Um, because the environment agency's job seems to be to clearly flood this area, and um, that's exactly what they're doing. So, you know, he's doing his job, I suppose, and uh, getting well paid for it. Well, I think that, that's it. There's la- layers of understanding to, to, to lay people, especially the, the local community, some of the people that we bumped into. Um, you know, it, it's that thing that we were, were discussing earlier, black is white, white is black. You know, you actually put the, this evidence in front of, of people's noses and they don't want to believe it it's there for them to see but they for some for some reason they it's just beyond their reality for the time being they are fighting fires they are you know wanting to get their homes homes back up and running um, at a later date i'm sure some of them are looking to relocate um, as of now and i think they're in a grieving process to be honest neil i think a lot of the people are uh, aren't wanting to confront the information even when you put it to them because of that that grieving process they want to get over it process it um and again it's just one of one of the first hurdles that people can't seem to to, to get yet uh, and that is that their government you know doesn't always have their best interests at heart but i, I think the, the the term climate change used in in this raft of policies um, is very clever um, climate change uh, i think by the the ipcc the intergovernmental panel on climate change um, define climate change as and it says i've got the quote here it's a, a change in the state of the climate that can be identified using statistical means for example by changes in the mean and or variability of its properties and that persists for an extended period typically decades or longer and it then goes on to say that it refers to any change in climate over time, whether due to natural variability or human activity. And I often pull up this definition on just that last bit there, natural variability or human activity. So natural variability, uh, some people know that that might refer to you know the sun, solar radiation, biotic processes. We've got things like tectonic activity in there as well, a bit of volcanism, volcano activity. But on the uh, human side of things, the anthropogenic side of things, we're being told that it's things like industry, transport, um, agriculture, buildings, waste, all of those typical um, CO2 producing activities that we're led to believe. But, and this is the big but, that there are a class of human activities that are not modelled within IPCC um, data crunching, and that is weather modification, atmospheric experimentation, and the military activity, which is documented to modify weather, change weather, essentially. So it's a very useful term for them. And as you know, you know, climate has always changed. Climate is always changing. So when they talk about, you know, this is due to climate change, you know, Technically, they are right. It is due to climate change, using their definition. But when you boil it down and you look at human processes, is it the public, humans, or is it the government, humans? So, again, there's another um, semantic argument that needs to be teased apart very carefully and trying to articulate that to people who are you know, trying to get fresh water move furniture off of low ground, uh, it, it, it's challenging. It, it's very challenging. Yeah, I think that the first hurdle is to get them to believe that the government uh, isn't uh, nice, shall we say. Um, we'll get another piece of music and we'll, we'll go through some of the, possibly go through, unless, unless you want to um, carry on with this topic at the moment, uh, which we'll come back to anyway. Um, 
we'll go through some of the presentation you did up in the, in the office of Potter's Bar um, and some of the examples where they've done this kind of thing before, um, which is some, something we discussed today and, and not necessarily in, in terms of um, weather modification, but um, anybody out there who has a list of everything that the British government has, has done against its uh, own people would come in very handy to uh, to show to people to say that, uh, look, this, this, they're prepared to do this, so what makes you think they wouldn't do this? Um, yeah, anybody with that kind of information could uh, drop it drop it to me at uh, neil at communitypressgroup.com and I'd be most grateful for it. But um, we're going to a piece of music now and the next one, quite appropriately, is to do with the uh, rain again and it's... Um, Welcome back to Reality Bites uh, Radio on the 13th of February 2014. Um, just discussing with uh, David our trip down to Somerset on Tuesday and the meeting the local people and the reaction to the information about um, government policy as it were and uh, how it clearly shows that the intention was to flood the area. But um, we mentioned uh, briefly just before the break there um, weather modification um, which I'm sure many listeners will be quite familiar with in the form of chemtrails, geoengineering, call it what you will. Um, so, David, do you want to seek into that? And, uh, well, take it from there. That's that's your your uh, topic. Sure. Well, we've had a kind of gift from the United Nations, another one, <laughs> uh, recently, and that was a, a full admission in, in a report um, looking into a, the team of weather modification um, 2012-2013, and in in that document, they actually state that 42 countries are now actively involved in weather modification programs that are act, that are active, fully active. So interestingly, the UK and the US are not mentioned, but obviously we know uh, through documentation that the US is is fully involved in modifying weather. I think uh, NASA and NOAA have put out some literature on that. But weather modification is very old, as many of the listeners know. Uh, I think some of the early references that I've dug out pertaining to weather modification go back to 1877, talking about um, Shailen Nathaniel and uh, the melting of the polar ice caps. I think from then, uh, 1946 is another key date. Uh, Vincent Schaefer did a lot of cloud seeding experimentation with dry ice. And then in 1952, we have uh, the RAF rainmakers, which were linked to the, the Lynmouth floods. Uh, I think 35 people died in that incident. Um, and then, of course, we've had Popeye, Operation Popeye. That was the Vietnamese uh, operations flying. Uh, I think they flew about 2,600 or thereabouts rainmaking missions over the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And then this thing called HARP. The High Frequency Active Rural Research Program came online in 1999, which is also mentioned in a EU uh, parliamentary document. Uh, there's actually a, a heading in there that, that says um, uh, HARP, um, using it as a, um, a, a piece of technology to alter uh, weather patterns. So that's uh, actively stated within there. Um, and then I think in 2006, the Alaska um, HARP facility came online. Now HARP, for many of you who may know, is, is quite old now. It, it's quite old. We've we've moved on to um, Doppler radar. We've moved on to the, the sea-based sea X-band radar that they can move out to sea. Um, again, Chinese snowstorms. Uh, in 2009, we've had the, the suppression of bad weather on the 60th anniversary parades. Uh, and now, kind of clocking around last year, we've had uh, physicists discussing um, ionising the atmosphere with uh, trillion watt lasers. This is terawatt lasers. So, again, it, it, it's all very old stuff. And there's a Weather Modification Association um, that has its own journal, etc. But this, again, kind of leads into the, the area of geoengineering quite nicely. I was re recently at a couple of uh, geoengineering public debates. These were in November and December last year, uh, held by David Keith, one of the lead geoengineers pushing the program at the moment. And again, it was very, very interesting considering it was a public debate. Uh, I, you know, I would, would put the question out to to the audience. Uh, you know, have a guess how many, on average, how many people. 
uh, from the public and academia attended those meetings. And, you know, it was 35 on average, 35 people. And you ask yourself, why? Why were there only 35 people on average at these public debates? Well, they, they didn't advertise it. It was only on the university website primarily. So I asked David Keith a couple of questions. I managed to get a couple of questions in. Um, one of my questions, I asked him about the, the visible effect. Once the, the we, program... Actually, actually do, we could actually play that audio if you want. Yeah, shall we, sh shall we do that? We do have that. Um, we'll just give uh, Paula a minute to line it up. Um, I think it's clip 36 first, is it? 36 or 48, which one is the, the first one? Hang on a minute, I'll just have a, have a quick peek. Um, yeah, I think, actually, somebody... Carry on, carry on. I think the, 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 the first clip I think would be nice to, to introduce at the moment is clip 36. Okay, if Paula's got... Um, clip 36 lined up. Um, we'll see if she can get it on there. Oh, the it's, it's still loading, apparently. It's still loading, so um, we'll have to chat a little bit longer until it's ready. I'll but, um, quick description. Yeah. So, what we're referring to, clip 36, is the the meeting, uh, the public debate at um, University College London. Uh, this was David Keith uh, discussing um, the, the basics of geoengineering. And as I said, I, I managed to get a question in towards the end. And I was asking him once the, the you know the, it's in full swing. What what are we likely to see? And uh, I think I'll I'll leave you to to actually play the clip um, to get the the full uh, the full experience. I think Neil, if we click on the clip, maybe halfway through, um, it uh, it will uh, save save some time. But uh, the, the chat behind me pipes up a little bit and says you know it's it, it's what's going on at the moment you know it's been happening um and interestingly um i was talking to a, a good friend of mine another kind of geoengineering researcher uh, max bliss he's in the south of france and he recently clipped a, uh, a screen a clipping from um a blog a blog site one of the the co-directors of the, the the project um his name escapes me right now, but I'll, I'll get back to you on that. And he actually openly admits that they've been geoengineering for a while. And when Max confronted him, uh, this was in Oxford, uh, he says, well, uh, you know, we, we've been geoengineering, uh, every, everybody's been geoengineering, but, um, you know, through um, accidental means. But when you actually look at the definition of geoengineering, it is the deliberate intervention in the Earth's climate system in order to moderate climate change. So uh, the chap's name was Julian uh, Sevalescu. So, uh, and he was connected to the Oxford, the Oxford program, I believe. And, and you told me he's run back how, up how, to Australia or something, though. Yeah, I, I, I believe he's over there at the moment. But, um, yeah. In, interesting I'm, I'm stuff. I'm not sure if we're going so, to get the, Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> I can. Uh, I've, I've got, we've got um, number 48. But this, uh, it won't play, apparently. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, we might have to just want shall to explain I, a bit more about it. Yeah. Shall I have a go at playing it at my end? It may come through. It may not. Just hang on. Hang on. Just a tick. Okay. No problem. Uh, I'll just um, talk away. Can um, you hear that? Not at all. Okay. Right. Um, no, not at all. No problem. Okay. Don't so put it out kind of uh, imaginary head on to this one, I think. So we asked David Keith, I say to him, once the project's in full swing, what are we likely to expect uh, from a, a visual perspective from the ground? And he says, well, it, it depends how much we do. Some it will be invisible and some will be visible. And he says it depends also on, on, on how we do it. So one could argue that uh, the invisible aspect of this program is is occurring uh, with with no uh, active uh, you know observation whatsoever, and they're talking about you know aluminium. Uh, they talked about aluminium previously. They're starting to veer away in the literature um, towards aluminium, but they're con kind of focusing on the on the sulfur sulfur dioxide acid rain. Um, and interestingly, David Keith, after coming to England, Oxford, and and London. 
conducting those public debates. He then went back to the States. And for some of your listeners who have done a bit of research, there's a clip of David Keith on the uh, the Steve, Stephen Colbert show uh, where uh, the uh, where, where David Keith is, is almost using humor. I, I'm sure the interview was was probably engineered to a degree. And uh, Stephen Colbert kind of says, you know, well, um, what if, you know, it's happening already? And I think he says that, you know, Uncle Sam isn't telling the public what's going on. And David Keith says, well, you know, I, I think that's kind of unlikely. And uh, Stephen says, you know, unlikely that the government wouldn't tell the public that they're doing something. And then the and the, and the, uh, the crowd kind of kind of cheer. So it's kind of glossed with a humor to it. And for those of you who have you know, kind of studied psychology and the use of humor within psychology and propaganda, it's a very, very powerful tool. So what I and others are seeing is a kind of slow disclosure, actually, of, of the geoengineering project. Um, recently, they viewed um, a, a clip of Harp on BBC Stargazing. Um, do you remember Brian Cox doing the stargazing series uh, last last uh, month? I, I don't have a TV, David, so I don't see any of that stuff. Okay, I think it was in December. Um, I, I can get back with a precise date, but I think it was December. And um, Brian Cox, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, was ho- co-hosting a series entitled Stargazing um, with astronomy, obviously looking into the stars, and they showed the the ice cat. Um, facility in Norway and they actually showed you the the interior of the the management room with the computers and the fact that they could now engineer synthetic auroras aurora borealis so again it, I feel that they're kind of glossing it over with popular science with with humor uh, we've had these debates in in the UK um, I understand that uh, there's also been debate in the states as well so it's being seeped out. They they can't keep this quiet for, for too much longer. And yeah. the other aspect of this, talking about keeping it quiet, is that during Christmas, so Christmas 2013, there was a significant reduction in visible spraying over, over the British Isles, over the land. Um, whether this, I, I believe, was a, a, a ploy to reduce the visual impact. I think, you know, the information is getting out there. People are starting to look up into the sky and uh, typically, you know, people go on walks on on Boxing Day, Christmas Day, family walks. And uh, yes, you know, I believe that the program was, you know, temporarily stopped in places or vastly reduced in activity for that, for that reason. No, I I certainly noticed it here. Um, I was out on, um, I think Christmas Day and Boxing Day, and there, right. there was nothing. There was nothing. There was I, I never even saw a plane in the sky. Um, you know, and a couple of days before that, it was uh, it was a checkerboard. Oh. Uh, so I, I don't I don't know where all the planes go. You know, I, they just seem to disappear. You know, on certain sure. days of the week, yeah. nothing. And and a lot of people reported exactly the same phenomena. So it wasn't just in you know in the south. Uh, I've been in contact with people in the Midlands and and up north who reported exactly the same thing. So we had, I think it was about seven days, between seven and ten days, in which we've had you know significantly reduced spraying activity over 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 Christmas last year. But of course, uh, it, it I noticed probably by the sixth or seventh of January, um, back back to normal. Uh, it's almost occurring on a, on a daily basis. I feel now. Uh, but in particular, over the past couple of weeks leading up to the to these storms rolling in off the Atlantic, we've had grey skies, very misty. We've had the haze. I've seen uh, some halos around the sun, obviously indicating the the polymers being used as well, polymer fibres. And uh, again, you know, we've got this relentless storm system building up in, in the Atlantic that just kind of sweeps up. Uh, across the UK from the southwest towards Scandinavia. And, uh, you know, I think there's another one coming in. But, uh, you know, people just can't can't see, 
can't see the I can't see the the information. You put it in front of them, and it, it's very challenging. But this this is a gift in a way for the movement. I think something like this, and I always say in my talk that that people don't you know start to investigate unless or until it affects them directly. Yeah, we're, we're talking about the flooding, of course, uh, not the the spraying. Um, yes. Because yeah. obviously, you know that that it's a it's a great inroad. I mean, if they can if they can just get their head around the fact that it's a deliberate act by the government to to flood them out, and and you know if um, if somebody dies in this, and the, the evidence is there that this is deliberate, then I mean I'm not you know I hope nobody does die, obviously. But um, if somebody does die, uh, I mean, we heard we heard on Tuesday that um, some gentleman had, had a heart attack. I mean, who's liable for that? You know, if uh, if these people are doing this kind of thing deliberately, th th there's got to be a, a case question. to answer somewhere. You know. Yeah. There's I mean, more and more talk of of people actively looking for the legal processes for you know malfeasance holding individuals. Um, uh, to account rather than you know the umbrella of departments what have you uh, so so this yeah. has to be looked at and, and people are make, starting to make slow inroads um, holding people accountable on a, on a personal personal level right I've got a couple of questions in the chat box uh, on awake radio uh, does David have an opinion who is behind the spring and the second question is Morgellons real or disinformation Okay, um, who is behind the spraying? That's a big question. I think the, the way to answer this quite quite you know briefly is the fact that because military is involved, then you start to have to look towards the, the defence departments. So the MOD will have to know at some level, uh, upper government, MI5, MI6 will have to know at some level. Um, the United Nations, obviously, I, I believe... Um, there are kind of some some key points relating to the fact that United Nations are being used. The white aircraft that have been seen uh, also been spotted at aircraft bases, United Nations bases. Um, military contractors are also involved, I believe. So uh, a lot of this, the over, over in the United States, we've got the military contractors over there. Um, Evergreen uh, Air have been implicated as well. And and the second question, Morgellons. Is it uh, is it hoax? Is it uh, you know disinformation? Is it put out there to, to scare people? And I can categorically tell you that it is real. It's a real phenomenon. Um, I, I spoke in Germany in October last year to uh, about 200 people, um, of which maybe half of them were doctors, neurosurgeons, um, people of that ilk. And one of the researchers that I was presenting with worked with a Morgellons patient in Norway. Um, a chap called Harold Kurzweiler. Uh, he's a German German researcher, and we stayed up till the early hours in the morning after the after the conference, talking about his experiences with his uh, Norwegian patient. He was showing me a lot of documentation, a lot of photographs that uh, the microscopists had provided him with. And yes, it, it is real. Um, I, I can confirm that. I think there's okay. a few. Yeah. Yeah, uh, somebody's um, put in uh, nanotechnology as well. And the question prior to that, before it goes off the screen, uh, ask how the planes layer the jet stream with chemicals. I'm not quite sure what that means, but... Uh, how do they layer the jet stream? Okay, yeah. so I, I think there's there's been a lot of talk on the jet stream uh, over the past couple of years i know the bbc have put out specific broadcasts generally during the weather forecast talking about the jet stream what is the jet stream how it flows what it is exactly and uh, just just to cover that briefly there are typically three uh, major jet streams one around the equator and one in the northern and hem southern hemisphere and there are between six and nine kilometers in in the uh, in, in the atmosphere and these are kind of like the, the rivers of the planet, but in the atmosphere, they take around vast quantities of moisture at, uh, at high speed. So between, uh, I've heard between two and 600 miles an hour, typically between two and 300 miles an hour, I think is more 
it's more realistic. That's uh, more uh, of the figures that I've I've been com- coming across. But uh, there was reports of being able to manipulate jet streams. Um, the, the HARP patent, um, in particular, talks to about that. A patent by Bernard Eastland in 1997, um, talking about um, altering portions of the upper uh, magnetosphere with with this technology. And essentially, it's a uh, ground-based radar airways and they can use a, a polarized wave where they can piggyback a signal also on on a first signal and there are numerous ionospheric heating installations around the world now so the harp in alaska is the the, the most uh, talked about and discussed uh, recently i i heard last year that they were taking the the harp alaska project offline because of funding um Again, I'm, I'm not quite sure whether that's the case, but uh, with the ionospheric heating installations all across the world, with the uh, the next rad, the next generation radar, with the you know, Doppler radar, with these SBX systems that they can drag out to sea, um, and there's uh, you know, a whole plethora of different types of ionospheric heaters now. So in concert, you can use these heaters to heat certain portions of the ionosphere so we're sending up um, columns of warm warm air or heated air should i say and this this column of warm air acts as almost like a barrier they call them omega blocks so if you put a block uh, a, co- a column of, of you know warming uh, rising air in the path of a jet stream then that jet stream will then have to veer uh, around that column of air so let's say if you've got uh, a column directly uh, just maybe to the north of the jet stream so the jet stream will have a, a propensity to move towards the south and then if you then triangulate maybe three or more ionospheric heating installations you could get an effective radiated capacity of you know 3.6 or thereabouts you know billion watts of uh, of energy and i'm sure those figures are probably out of date now i'm i'm pretty certain that you know we we might be uh, far in excess of you know three or four billion uh, what sort of energy now so there's been talk of locking jet streams in place as well so almost making um, uh, like a corridor of omega blocks where the jet stream is almost kind of I wouldn't say bouncing off of these uh, omega blocks but um, putting strategic places so when the jet stream starts to naturally curve um, as it does towards the north or south then you know a block being put in in place t- to lock uh, a stream in a certain position so i don't know yeah that's kind of a long answer but to, gen- generally that's what what my research has been uh, uncovering at the moment and it's just not not my research as well i've been in contact with numerous other researchers who who we were coming up with pretty much the same the same kind of synopsis yeah well, Paul, Paul has kindly uh, sent me a link to the Telegraph in 2009, which uh, it's not about the jet stream, but uh, Chinese government take, makes it snow in Beijing in order to fight drought. And uh, uh, we've seen the, uh, the videos from America where the snow um, people have uh, tested um, using using lighters and stuff, which possibly is not, is not the best way of doing it, but um, they, they show the snow not melting. And... Um, they, they say there's a, a burning smell of it and uh, we were talking there during the break um, well, about half an hour ago or so now that um, we've not had any snow here to, to test it out which um, we're kind of desperate to get our hands on to see if there's any uh, truth in that argument although of course it may not be the same snow that uh, has been tested over in America who knows but uh, that's that's just an aside the, the other question was on uh, nanotechnology and um, I suppose the the metals that we're, we're ingesting and what they're doing to us. But um, we'll, we'll go to another piece of music first and come back and, and talk about that, perhaps. Uh, the next bit is, um, you know, ne- never mind the fracking, folk. Uh, folks, the, the water's getting poisoned already with the, uh, the stuff they're spraying in the air, and this is uh, mud honey and poisoned water. Welcome back to Reality Bites Radio. Uh, we got caught a bit on the hop there because uh, the countdown went from a minute to three seconds all of a sudden, but uh, there you go. Um we were discussing off here, but we're going to cover some of these questions and we might go to another piece of music and then come back and um, change tack slightly. Uh, still still to do with geoengineering, but um, another couple of issues around it. Uh, one of the, I think, uh, the t- trying to take them in order, 
Uh, there was a question about uh, nanotechnology from Kerry. Um, you, uh, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, I know we're, we're breathing in these metals and um, there's a lot of talk of us um, basically becoming kind of um, antennas, if you like, uh, and this stuff changing our, our whole kind of metabolism, if you like, not metabolism, our physiology. Um, what would you what would you say to that? Um, again, once uh, I first came across this nanotech, um, nanotech feeds into uh, the Morgellons uh, debate as well. Um, I, I was horrified, as, as a lot of people are. It's one of those darker areas of this program that a lot of people um, don't want to look at for obvious reasons. It is very alarming. I think for those of you who have looked through the research of uh, Jan Smith, on Morgellons exposed, um, Sophia Smallstorm, uh, the, the, the researcher that I was working with in Germany, um, Howard Kutzweiler has also put out um, papers on on Morgellons um, and working with working with people. It, it's alarming. Um, so what I can say is that there are um, filaments, fibers being sprayed. I know Clifford Conicom has done a lot of research uh, and has published independently a lot of work on this. Can we say that they are from jet trails exclusively? Uh, I don't think so. I don't think we have enough of that evidence to conclusively say um, that it is from uh, these chemical trails, persistent jet contrails. It might be added to our food, for instance. It might be in the water. Um, and it might come even from other environmental components. We, you know, I don't think quite yet that we can safely say that it's from that source or, or this source in particular. But I, I personally, again, I, I just put, putting it out there, it's uh, purely circumstantial evidence, but I, I personally feel that it's probably coming from, from everything. Uh, and once you put the pieces of the puzzle together, and once you've gone through a little... Uh, um, you know, kind of circle of looking at this stuff, you can't get, you know, you can't come to another conclusion other than the fact that anything that can be weaponized probably is weaponized. Um, so, so the nanotech, focusing on what, what it's doing to our anatomy, uh, I agree with you, Neil. Yes, we are no longer uh, neutral. Um, we, we are becoming um, conductive beings, even more so. I think the the EMF agenda, the electromagnetic fields, is one of the most uh, important um, agendas to openly talk about. I often think, you know, if electromagnetic fields were coloured in any way, let's say if they had a, a slight reddish or pinkish tinge, um, very often you probably couldn't see, you know, to the other side of the room. Maybe, let's say, in a, a London flat where sometimes you pop on your uh, laptop and look for some networks and you know you might see 15 different you know wi-fi networks i think you know if if you could see the color of them uh, you i think you know a lot of people would be horrified but we can't and that's one of the things that people again you know you, you can't see out of sight out of mind uh, i was only driving down the the m3 and the m25 the other day. i took a uh, a t two hour trip from Dorset to uh, to Sussex and I think I counted about 63 different uh, masts there was a variety of masts so I think electromagnetic fields together with our increased conductivity through the heavy metals is a huge part of it yeah, and right. as many just, of our just just about just about and I was when I when I lived over in Ireland I had a friend of mine who worked for um Aircom which was the equivalent of British Telecom over there and he had one of these um, machines that could pick up the, the signals from the towers. And we were out. I was out one day in his van, and it was, I don't know where we were going, but we're out in the middle of nowhere, basically. And he says, come on, we'll stop the van. He, he got out, and he put this thing on. And he says, watch this. And I had a little screen on it, and he was picking up, I think it was 19 different um, signals from masts. Sure. And this, and this was in the middle of nowhere, never mind uh, a city. And uh, he said, that's, that's your microwave radiation. Uh, it's everywhere, you know. So I mean, it, yeah. there's no escaping. I mean, if if we are um, conductive, there there is no escaping it. it. Doesn't matter where you are in the country, you know. 
that, that's just an aside anyway. Carry on, carry on with what you were saying there. Sure. Well, just to kind of expand on that point, one of the reasons why I tackled this issue in particular is through the you know the, the argument that you can choose what you drink and you can choose what you eat, but you cannot choose the air you breathe and you cannot choose whether you're going to be bombarded with microwaves. So, you know, there, there are certain things that when you look at the, you know, your autonomy and what you can and can't do, um, when you come to the realization that you can't escape certain things in, in our environment, then, you know, I, I can't see any other option than, than taking action in, and, and addressing it, to be honest. Um, there are patents pertaining to EMF and implanting messages, signals, um, music. I think uh, back in the 50s, they were experimenting with uh, voice to scale technology. Um, and of course, you know, your listeners know that when this technology is given to the given to the people or showed showed to the people, um, you know, we're looking at maybe 10, 20, 30, sometimes even 50 years. Um, you know, this, this technology has come about and this is old, old military, military gear now. So I, I've heard a lot of talk recently about the ability to track individuals through the heartbeat signatures. So every human being has a unique um, heartbeat frequency and signature attached to them, which can be um, tracked through, I believe, uh, the research is showing um, through satellites. I also think that, again, this is purely um, circumstantial at the moment. Um, I, I think everybody is being tracked through additives that we are ingesting uh, through the air. There's been talk of 3D holographic imaging. So, again, this is old technology. They were using this back in uh, 2004. Um, it came out of the variable terrain radio parabolic equation model, the VTRPE, where they were looking at um, using 3D holographic modelling. So they would spray a, a, a war zone with barium in particular and using satellite imagery um, and using maybe ships stationed out at sea. They could, with radar and satellites, start to create a 3D picture of a battlefield. So if you can imagine barium particulates in the air, uh, penetrating into buildings, into caves, etc., and then uh, people within a, a control room with a joystick could then start to move around, you know, this vast area, this battlefield, and you can start to plot and see in real time where your, you know, your forces are, where the the, the enemy is. So all of this again is very, very old now. Um, incidentally, I'd, I'd just like to talk about a, a piece of um, documentation I, I found the other day. It's from the, um, the U.S. Air Force, and it's uh, policy document 200506161174, and it's the, the title is Development and Evaluation of a Novel Implantable Nanosensor for Real-Time monitor Monitoring of individual cells and cellular signaling. So, you know, if this is open source public documentation, um, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure of this particular um, date of, of this report. I've only got the front cover. Somebody, somebody sent me a, a while back. But I, I, I do believe that we are entering the, the transhumanist um, phase. Um, and for those of you who, who aren't uh, familiar with the, the term transhumanism, it's the, the emergence of uh, biology with technology. And again, it's a very old um, area of science where I think even back in uh, Plato's day, they were talking about, you know, eugenics and the need to breed certain traits in and out of humans f in order to, to, to fulfill specific purposes. But I think now we're going in towards this scientific era where we are a lot more controllable through, uh, again, through, the, through EMFs, through our changing biology. 
Um, EMF fields disrupt the endocrine system. They can cause cataracts. They alter our DNA. They can harm fetuses. You know, there's a big literature on on those type of chemical disruptions within our physiology. It's all out there for people to see. Uh, is there a question? Sorry. No, 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 carry on. I've just got another few questions coming in, so uh, we'll, we'll get around to them. But no, just finish off on that, and um, we'll, we'll move on to the next question, if that's okay. I was just going to say that we are we are moving into this era. Um, I think Ray Kurzweil um, from Google calls it singularity. Yeah. There's, um, a, there's, a, great, there's, a, there's a great documentary out there. Uh, um, try, oh, what's it called? Uh I can't remember what it's called. It's to do with transhumanism anyway, but um, I think it's about an hour long. Uh, the name will come to me possibly in the break room when that'll be some music, but um, uh, it's about, I think it's about six or seven years old now, but um, that, that goes through the whole thing. And, and yeah, it comes to the singularity um, and it's all in there. But um, going, I'm just trying to run back through the questions. Um, there was one about the recycled batteries um, being used in the whatever the spring there would you know much about that i do indeed i have first hand information on on that but sadly it's not documented so i can confirm that batteries our recycled batteries are apparently going to processing plants uh, the the chemicals being extracted from from the batteries and being aerosolized um, I, I, probably I'd like to kind of stay on a bit more safer ground and, and not talk too much about that but I, I can say it's first hand uh, knowledge from very credible sources uh, but I, I, I cannot uh, cannot divulge too much more than that at the, at the moment That's fair enough, we, we, we stick to what we can prove, that's, that's the best way to do it isn't it? Um, the, the other thing was the a lot of pilots um, getting ill uh, obviously the it's something to do with the, the ventilation systems and stuff going into the cabin. Uh, I think it was uh, in 1999. Uh, a, a, a illness came about. Um, it was entitled um, the neurotoxicity. Um, oh, it slips my <laughs> slips my mind. That's the, that's the barium for you. It was called aerotoxic syndrome. It came about in 1999, and the official line is that in order to take air into the cabin, the air is extracted through a bleed valve, which is stationed in the actual jet itself. And it siphons off a minute proportion of outside air through through the engine, uh, is then filtered, and then is introduced safely, quote unquote safely, um, into, into, the cabin, into the cabin spaces. And pilots, cabin crew, are now reporting en masse. I recently spoke to a good friend, uh, Dr. Dietrich Klinghart from the, the Klinghart uh, Academy. Um, he's got uh, institutes over in, uh, in the States, in Germany, uh, in Switzerland. And uh, we were discussing that one of his cl close colleagues uh, was working with a lot of people with these uh, illnesses, pilots in particular, talking about the the fatigue extreme fatigue from from feeling ill and uh, again max bliss and i went to bristol airport this was back in september last year and we'd printed out some leaflets with aerotoxic syndrome across the top and the the symptoms and we were just alerting we were looking for pilots in particular um, we, we came across a couple of cabin crew members, uh, probably, I think probably about seven or eight cabin crew. We managed to in enter in some, some form of dialogue before the police got hold of us and tried to arrest us. But we, we gave out maybe about 100 leaflets in total. We were engaging people, passengers as well. But, um, so the official line with aerotoxic syndrome is that it's a 40 bleed valve. And it's uh, it's something to do with the the oil um, in in this valve mixing with air, uh, causing cabin crew and pilots to become uh, disorientated, um, fatigued. Um, in fact, I think two BA pilots uh, last year um, died in kind of mysterious illness conditions. Um, 
that were attributed partially to this aerotoxic syndrome. And it's interesting when you look at the date, it came about in 1999, which as many of our listeners know that the, the aerosol spraying program kind of kicked off in earnest in about 1997, 1998. And then by 2000, uh, it was well underway. So again, when you, when you tie those, you know, pieces of the puzzle together we you know you do get uh, an emergence of these uh, cover stories essentially I, I you know i personally i do believe aerotoxic syndrome is a cover story for the air that you know pilots are flying through on a on a daily basis full of um, yeah, I, heavy metals yeah i, I do wonder that uh, the the timing of it because i mean 98 was uh, when the the last warming period was supposed to have stopped and then they started doing this, I mean, in some kind of way, um, in my opinion, uh, to try and keep up the pretense that the planet was actually warming. Um, because, of course, we, we know that cl uh, clouds trap heat in the atmosphere. And, uh, it, you know, maybe they were trying to do that. I, I, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. But um, uh, Kerry sent us a, a great picture. And you were talking earlier about the um, the... You know, if the if the the microwave um, radiation waves could be coloured, uh, and we'd see them, well, there was an article in the Daily Mail and uh, entitled "The Hidden Beauty of Mobile Signals." Psychedelic images reveal the patchwork quilt of data that cloaks the city's buildings. And and some guy has uh, has done this art. I don't know if it's an artist's impression or he's actually used some kind of technology. And the the city of uh, New York is a kind of like a, a multicoloured prism. Uh, of all these supposed signals going about the place, but I'm, I'm not sure if that's a a real image at all. But um, it, it looks like an artist's impression, to be honest. But um, the uh, the same concept applies. That somebody was thinking about this before. Um, but anyway, that's that's again that's that's an aside. But um, the other question was regarding you know if we're, if we're talking uh, a global phenomenon and the the. the is it fair to say it's the majority of these aircraft would be military, um, possibly because, uh, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, some days I, I can't see a plane at all, uh, and other days the, the sky is crisscrossed, uh, you know, like a, a fishing net. Um, how many planes are involved in this? And, and, you know, if we're talking about this supposedly mitigating uh, this farce of global warming, uh, how much CO2 has been pumped into the atmosphere with all these extra planes going up? It, it, it doesn't make it, any sense. It, it doesn't make any sense. No, it, it really doesn't. Um, I think, uh, the, in terms of spraying activity, a lot of researchers that I've been, been in contact with o over the past couple of years, um, uh, we're all kind of coming to the conclusion that military planes are being deployed early in the morning, principally between four and seven o'clock in the morning. A lot of the what I would call the base spraying is conducted. Um, so a lot of people waking up seven, eight o'clock, get out on the streets. Uh, by that time, what I call the you know the big super bloomers. So the trails have expanded uh, with a particular uh, composition to sustain um, huge cloud cover, um, which is then topped up by a lot of the commercial flights going uh, going over. I don't know between eight o'clock and midday. Not always, but this is a, a recurring pattern that a lot of researchers are reporting. And then, you know, throughout the day, throughout the afternoon, uh, commercial planes will be left to increase the, uh, the the spray the spray cover. I don't know if that's something that you that you personally Neil have, have experienced. Is that something that you've kind of concur with? Absolutely, I have been. Uh, I've, I've, uh, when I lived in Ireland, uh, it was it was illegal for aircraft to fly over the over certain parts of the country. After I think it was after ten o'clock at night, right, uh, and certainly after midnight. And and yet I stayed in Dublin for a while, and you would hear aircraft flying over very very high altitude. Um, and you know, some in, in, in summer when it was it was light at five o'clock in the morning or whatever, you, you could look out the window and you see these trails everywhere, and then you, you go back to sleep and get up at seven or eight, and the cloud would just be there would be no blue sky whatsoever, you know, and, and that was uh, that was back uh, I'd say what ten years ago, that was going on, sure. and I, I've seen I've seen the same thing here. Uh -huh. Sim similarly, 
evening, yesterday evening, I was I was in London, North London, and uh, I saw it was probably about I don't know nine o'clock. Uh, I, I, I saw a significant covering o- over parts of North London, uh, a few few trails that that were left that it just started to to, to catch and expand. So. You know, but very often we can't see the, the trails when there's low, you know, natural cloud cover, when there's, you know, that silvery haze that comes over by maybe 11, 12, 1 o'clock uh, in the afternoon. Uh, and then you'll be lucky enough or unlucky enough to, to catch, uh, you know, a, a peppering of blue. And uh, within the blue, you'll see, you know, the, 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 the haze, the, the lines being conducted, spraying above natural cloud cover, which then prompts the question... If this spraying program is for the sole purpose of reflecting solar radiation away from Earth to cool us down, why, with fairly accurate cloud models, if you know, for, for instance, if we know that we are going to have a natural cloud cover for maybe maybe you know five or six hours in the morning, why 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 spray above natural cloud cover when? You know, low cumulus cloud actually reflects solar radiation more effectively than than cirrus cloud cover. Well, so, I've seen I've seen this on many occasions when uh, it, we we see kind of broken cloud, and uh, all of a sudden you get a patch of blue sky, and you'll see trails everywhere above these cloud, way above them. Yeah. Uh, and 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 sometimes you'll see a, a patch of clear sky amongst the clouds, and then all of a sudden you'll see the planes flying across to to literally fill it in. I've seen that as well. Yes, yeah, I, I, I can, uh, I can vouch for what you're saying for sure. Yeah. Was yeah. well, there a question about the health effects from the uh, the spraying program? Um, Neil, was was there somebody asking what what this does t- to us? Uh, well, there was one on the, the no, not specifically. Um, but if, I mean, if you want to answer that, that's fine. Yeah, and no, I'd like to cover it because that's one of the key things that a lot of people, um, it, when I when I publicly speak, want to really get to grips with what it's doing to them. Uh, I think just to cover the basic chemicals that are being reported spraying. So the way I perceive it in my mind is a Venn diagram, you know, with the, the circles, the interlocking circles. So one of them is geoengineering. So that's uh, sulfur dioxide is what's being reported. Uh, aluminium oxide is another key, key proponent of that. Barium and barium sulfates, strontium uh, and salt. So uh, salt is being used for cloud whitening, remember. And the next interlinking, interlinking circle is the, the weather, weather modification. So um, silver iodide, uh, barium again, uh, nitrogen, uh, nano silver and a chemical called p benzene is also being being used uh, and then the third uh, interlocking circle is obviously the military activity so we've got the uh, aluminium coated fiberglass which is also known as chaff uh, many of your listeners i'm sure are aware and again barium salts so sulfur hexafluoride and trimethyl aluminium tma are also being added to to jet fuel so they're the, the kind of principal chemicals that a lot of researchers are, are, are finding in environmental samples. Now, moving on to what it's doing to us, well, it doesn't look good. Um, there's a, a big literature out there on the effects of aluminium in particular, interfering in our neurological systems. Uh, as many of you know, uh, aluminium uh, is not recognized by the blood-brain barrier. So uh, it, it interferes with our neurological pathways, our synaptic connections, etc. And uh, when you look at uh, Alzheimer's patients in particular, you see uh, a buildup of uh, aluminium in the entorhinal cortex area of, of the brain. So continual exposure to these heavy metals is so detrimental to our immune systems. So one of the things that you must remember is that even when you start to pick up, um, you know, colds, just general viruses, a lot of people are now reporting that they can't shake these typical, you know, traditional illnesses off in, you know, the, the three days that they that they could once before. But uh, a lot of people have, you know, cold spate lasting maybe a month now. 
Um, so aluminium in particular, uh, at, nano, at nanoscale, so this is uh, 10 uh, microns um, and, and smaller, in fact. I've looked at papers that talk about, uh, you know, 0.1 of a micron. Uh, so, you know, thousands of these particles can fit onto the, the tip of a, a, a pin. So aluminium is horrendous to our nervous system. Um, I've already mentioned Alzheimer's and, and dementia. Um, it's also linked to short-term memory loss and lethargy. So a lot of people are reporting, you know, that that kind of that zest, that zing. Once they've woken up, they just don't want to to get up and do much. So le- le- lethargy sets in. Uh, trembling, uh, pulmonary fibrosis is also linked to aluminium oxide, uh, as is uh, lung damage. But so moving on to barium. Uh, again, there's a big literature out there for the uh, the health impacts of a continued exposure to barium. Now, barium again is so so bad for our immune system. So when we're you know in constant contact with barium, we're again picking up traditional diseases. But uh, in particular, barium increases blood pressure. It starts to interfere in our you know cardiac system. So a lot of people are reporting uh, weak and and aching muscles. Um, stomach irritation, interestingly, is also linked to barium exposure. Um, changes in uh, nerve reflexes. Uh, again, you know, breathing this stuff in is also linked to the asthma epidemic that we've had over the past couple of decades. Um, it depletes potassium level as well. So, so people, you know, may wish to bear in mind their um, potassium intake um, through, through this program. And on the lesser end of the scale, people are reporting, you know, kind of headaches uh, that may be in part due to uh, different pressures, obviously, you know, when they're spraying and the uh, the radio frequencies are being used as well. Uh, we're getting pressure differentials. Typically, we're having low pressure systems um, to fill the void through displacement principles, so, uh, headaches, dry eyes. Uh, I, in particular, suffer from dry eyes on heavy spray days, sore throats and uh, sinuses, sinus problems as well uh, is, a, is a big um, uh, proponent to this. So SAD, some people, uh, seasonal affected disorder. So what, you know, once we're continually cast under this silvery blanket, uh, we, we don't get to see blue sky, um, sun. So vitamin D, again, is another big part of it. Uh, There are reports that Ricketts has made a return. Uh, Personally, I wouldn't put that down to the spraying program at all. I think a lot of time, you know, the youth in particular are locked into their uh, Facebook and Twitter accounts on their iPhones. So they're spending a lot of time indoors, I think. Um, Heart complaints and and cancer as well. So... uh, you know, there's there's a whole raft, to be honest. Autoimmune, uh, you know, go you, can, you can go on. Autoimmune yeah. in in I, in and of itself is a you know list. list yeah, of well, I mean, I've, and of course that that leads on to other other uh, problems. But I, I was speaking to you yesterday, and uh, I told you about my tinnitus. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And I, I I never had that when I lived in Ireland, although there was still spraying going on there. Maybe they were spraying something different, I don't know. But um, I lived out in the countryside. I, didn't, I wasn't uh, anywhere near a city or, or town or anything. Um, but as soon as I got back to Edinburgh, it started. And I've, I've never got rid of it since. But um, just uh, as, a, as an aside, I've got a, a quote from Ryanair posted by uh, one of the folks in the chat box. Uh, this is Ryanair, the, the budget airlines. Head of engineering and also chief pilots have been advised of the following. Our aircraft in no way have chemical spraying capability, nor do the Boeing 737s flown by Ryanair. The vapour trails people can usually see are mixtures of... Oh, it's just disappeared off the page. <laughs> One second, I have to scroll down again. Um, are a mixture of gases, water vapour and post-combustion elements from the engines at high altitude in the cooler air. The same fuel used for takeoff is used throughout the flight from the same tanks and the same suppliers at our network airports. There is certainly no additional fuel, aerosols or other substances used once in the cruise, in very commas. We are not involved in or have any knowledge of stratospheric geoengineering projects. The stratosphere, depending on latitude, is predominantly above the cruising altitude of our aircraft. So that that's apparently directly from Ryanair. So... Uh- I, I, I can I honestly know. tell you that I've probably heard that uh, little, you know, couple of paragraphs you've read out there 
numerous times, numerous times. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I, I, would, wash, I think they call that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's a, a kind of template response that a lot of the commercial uh, aviation companies just send out, uh, as as does our government, actually. There's a uh, there's actually a fact sheet that you can download from the uh, the dot gov website, um, talking about the uh, you know chemtrails in particular, and and the public uh, alarm to to uh, what you know people are thinking are um, heavy metals etc. So uh, it, it, again, it, it's just interesting the, the level of disinformation that we are continually fed. You know, I, was, I was just going. To, I was just going to come on to that um, because we we did have a discussion today. I, I for the life of me, I can't uh, I can't remember the thing I downloaded today. I, I, I did, did you pick up that copy I printed off, where the guy um, was saying all the right things about uh, geoengineering, chemtrails, uh, all the different aspects of it, the health implication and everything. But uh, right at the end, it was uh, it, it basically uh, to paraphrase said. Um, of course, we know that um, global warming is, is real. I mean, I think that was the exact word. Global warming is real. Uh, we have to do something about it. The Arctic's melting. The Antarctic, uh, Western Antarctic ice shelf is breaking up. Blah, blah, blah. All, uh, he could have um, cut and pasted that quote from the IPCC. And uh, I have become very, very suspicious of um, Geoengineering Watch, who just appeared out of nowhere. Uh, they're all over Alex Jones and every other um, alternative media uh, outlet. Um, I actually emailed Dane Wigington myself, and he, he never got back to me. Um, but um, he's another one who who will say all the right things on geoengineering, chemtrails, call it what you will, and yet will push the whole idea that um, man-made global warming is real in terms of CO2. Not not um, geoengineering, uh, specifically CO two, and I, I, I do think uh, uh, Kristen Kristen Megan uh, Kristen Megan is uh, is genuine. But I saw a video of her recently where she was um, openly promoting uh, geoengineering watch as as the site uh, to go to for your information, and um, it, I mean we're well aware that uh, the other side put out. Um, our leaders, as as it were, uh, if you want to use that term, um, before they even uh, move their pieces on the chessboard, as uh, Alan Watts so famous for saying. Um, so you've you've got to wonder um, about uh, these uh, very very slick websites and um, what their real agenda is. That's just my opinion. You may not share it, but um, that's I I just see what's on my mind i don't care sure and uh, i i know dane we we've had many a conversation uh i i email him and uh, no you're right he he does push the, uh, the the global warming um anthropogenic climate change uh, agenda i had a a kind of a, a distressing call recently from uh, a friend who was saying, David? David, have you you know have you listened to to Dane Wigginton's recent? Uh, I think he he's put a presentation out there. I think it's about one hour seventeen or so, something uh, of that length. And she said, you know, he's he's really pushing the climate change thing. And uh, what, what are we going to do about it? And she was, you know, she's quite quite panicked by it all, to be honest. And she felt like you know the Earth was in some kind of you know hyper meltdown uh, because of because of this presentation. And I said to her. I said, uh, you know, not everybody is going to agree with all of the material. Um, personally, I, I, I don't buy into the, the climate change myth hoax at all. I think there's uh, a sufficient body of evidence to suggest that it's definitely not happening. And when you uh, engage your critical thinking cogs, you come across the United Nations documents, you come across the, the first global revolution report by the Club of Rome. And uh, it, it even mentions it in the uh, the Iron Mountain report. And, you know, some people don't mention that. Um, that was under the, uh, I think, uh, well, I can't remember what administration that was under, uh, but came out in the 60s. I think it was 67 or thereabouts. Um, but uh, it, it's in there as well talking about the need to kind of drag our heels on the whole pollution thing and 
um, the, the environmental threat as a uh, as a replacement for war. So there there are many many clues many clues. Um, Kennedy talks about the whole weather modification aspect back in back in the sixties. I think that was sixty one. I think he, he he talks about that. Um, so and I said to her, you know, we're not gonna, all going to agree, but uh, yes, you know, the other side do put out controlled opposition. Um, I'm still, in, you know, undecided, uh, to be honest. Um, having come from academia, I, I can say, Neil, that your your teaching, your understanding, your psychological entrenchment goes very deep, actually. And if you spent a lot of time writing about climate change, uh, and I did, you know, I, 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 I wrote conference papers, I published a journal article about um, domestic electricity loads uh, and climate change is the backstory and you know how we should be looking at ways to to curb our co2 emissions and you know personally i, I was talking about this not only you know th- three or four years ago uh, but not everybody makes it out out of that mindset but you know y- you will pick up other strands of the puzzle you may wish to run with so and it, it's very difficult it is very difficult, but Geoengineering Watch is very comprehensive. It's very well managed. They pick up uh, a lot of the breaking stories uh, before before other websites, and uh, I know that there's you know more than more than uh, one person behind that website for sure. Um, so again, it, it's something to bear in mind. I think I think Neil. Yeah, I just uh, I you know I um, call me sceptical. Um, but um, no, I just uh, I can't. I find I find it really hard to believe that um, people who do do that much research and they know they know that the the powers that be are are basically murdering us, and yet they can't quite sure. get their head around the fact that um, the light is about a bit of warm weather. That's that's just my take on it. But uh, anyway, um, move, uh, we've not we've not really got that much time left. Um, uh, I want to mention something before we went off there about uh, next week. Um, have you anything else you want to you want to throw in the mix uh, for the next what three minutes? Yeah, I, I'd like to say something, just kind of bringing it back to where we started off. Uh, we spent time down in Boroughbridge on the Somerset levels with a view to engaging the, the local community there and just getting into their headspace. To be honest, um, because. I want to go back to many parts of the UK that have been flooded, um, not just the Somerset levels, but um, I'm actively putting out a a call for anybody who has venues in and around the flooded areas in mind that uh, that I could hold a a presentation at. So we're looking at places uh, like Oxford, um, Staines, Chertsey, uh, Windsor, uh, Gloucester, places like that. I think... You know, once the dust has settled, people will start to ask questions. It has directly affected them. And I know, Neil, we were discussing uh, earlier about um, getting the information out there on some kind of um, tour as such. So, uh, yes, I, I kind of put it, just put that out there that um, we are looking for these for these venues. We are looking for places and for indeed people to, to, to help out with getting out uh, basic information in the, in the form of flyers, etc. Yeah. Well, well, we had uh, one of our regular uh, listeners, uh, Jewel, uh, and mentioned uh, quite early on during the talk that uh, one of the universities up in Derby were inviting people along to to talk. So possibly we could get up there sometime and do something. Yeah, it's, it's worth a go. It's worth a go for sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll put out to Jewel as, as he's listening here. Um, you know, if we can get as a venue and uh, a crowd, that'd be good. Um. Uh, Jules actually asking if you've got an opinion on fracking, but we've only got about a minute left, so um, I don't know if you want to if you want to do that quickly. And the final question is, David, worried about going public on us? Well, you are public on it, so um, obviously you're not. I, mean, I, I should just say that uh, we had this discussion last night over a bit of dinner, and uh, just for the listeners, David threw away his PhD to do this, so um, I think um, all credit to him on that one. But, um, there you go. You got about um, one minute, David. To, to answer the, the fracking question if you want to 
Um, I, I think fracking personally is, again, when you read between the lines, it's, it's part of a larger agenda. I think it's been going on for a, a fairly long, you know, a long time. Well, it's, it's been uh, going on 25 years in Britain already. It has. So, no, you're right. You're right. Yeah. It, 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 it's one of those kind of new phenomena, but it has been around, as you say, for, for, for a while. Um, it's a huge topic, Neil. It's an absolutely huge topic, and uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not a, a specialist as such in, in fracking, but uh, it, it's not good. Essentially, it's I, I don't think it's uh, you know. Well, regardless, if it if it comes out the ground or stays in the ground, we ain't going to get the benefit of it. So there's another agenda behind it. That, that's that's how I see it. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I think that's it. But um, right. um, yeah, just to kind of yeah. round up very quickly, I, I think you know this is a good opportunity, and I think uh, you know people are waking up in their droves, and this flooding event has personally affected many many people. So uh, I think well, uh, I- it's a great opportunity. Yeah, I think as as, as uh, the elites would have it, and the politicians that never let a good opportunity go to waste. And I think we should uh, grab this one and um, make sure we can um, use it in inverted commas to our advantage and uh, actually open people's eyes a little bit wider to exactly what's going on, um, and not just in the uh, the on the issue of flooding. But um, I think once once people realise that uh, their government is acting against their best interests on every level, on well, on that on the <laughs> on the Somerset levels, shall we say, um, they might start looking at other things, and um, hopefully we can we can uh, take advantage of this and uh, do something about it. So um, I'll finish at that because I just I just want to mention quickly that um, on Wednesday, all over the country, if you go to the UK Rebellion uh, website, just type in UK rebellion will take you there there's a demonstration against atos um it's i think 64 uh, towns and cities across the country on wednesday i think it, they run from uh, eight o'clock to six o'clock in the evening so there's, there's plenty of time to get along if you can uh, to the local atos offices um basically pretend to, protesting against atos murdering people which is exactly what they're doing and interestingly enough we have the green party who have co-opted this and hopefully natalie bennett will be down in london where we are and I can have a word with her about her, um, her great belief in the smart grid system, of which Atos is a huge player. Uh, yet she's starting to protesting. I don't know what that's about. But, um, there you go. So, David, um, I'm sure we'll uh, we'll chat again soon. And um, you deserve a, a good rest after your few days up in uh, Potter's Bar and uh, Somerset. It's been a couple of yeah, it's been a couple of really busy, uh, really busy days. Um, you know, we plan to get to bed early and end up invariably crawling in at you know midnight, one o'clock. So uh, we'll oh, do can, it again. I, can, I, can I just reiterate? Um, you weren't getting in bed with me. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I think that should be taken for the uh, for the listeners. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, that that was Dave. Okay. Anyway, okay, we'll we'll call it a day there, and uh, we're going to finish quite appropriately with um, a band uh, who I've got a lot of time for, uh, Killing Joke, and this is. <laughs>